special thanks to all of you staying, staying with us through today. We appreciate that very much. Um, I have a few brief closing comments after this panel, but we'd like to get ahead of this panel immediately. Um, this panel is uh, titled The Role of Health, Education and Philanthropy. Uh, in a sense, we've lost health. We've had health. Uh, Kevin uh, spoke graciously to us in the last panel, and he's had to go off to deal with real health matters. He has a, a surgery with people who are awaiting him. So we've rearranged things a little bit, and what we have is, 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 is very much education and philanthropy in this session. A chance, I think, to expand the conversation we were already having today, uh, although we did end up with education a little bit earlier. So we'll begin immediately then um, with my colleague uh, from UCD, Patrick Gibbons. Pat Gibbons. Uh, Pat is director of the Centre for Human Humanitarian Action at University College Dublin and president of the Network on Humanitarian Assistance, NOAA, uh, 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 a major international network that he's taken the leading role in. Uh, he worked with the Irish government and various NGOs in Africa before returning to academia to establish the master's program. He teaches humanitarian principles and practice at UCD and also at a number of European universities. His university research includes humanitarian principles, post-crisis transition context, uh, reconciliation and local governance. Welcome, Pat. Thank you very much, Lean. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here today, uh, and it's great to be back in New York. Just about 30 years ago, I actually worked here. At that time, I think I, I climbed to heights never before or never after reached. I was a scaffolder, <laughs> and I'm looking out the window and seeing the scaffolders there at the moment, uh, and it brings, brings me back. In the meantime, I've had the opportunity to, to work with Irish Aid, work with Irish NGOs, and work with the private sector. Actually, Glan Bia was spoken of today. Uh, more recently, I've come back to UCD, where I'm uh, currently, as Liam said, heading up the Humanitarian Action Programme there. What I'm going to try to do is to address three main issues in, an in analysing the history and future of the Irish role in shaping humanitarian assistance education. The, the three areas I look at is, I, I'm going to reflect back a little bit on what you heard about the contemporary challenges for humanitarian assistance. Very much on the basis that any initiative should be demand driven, uh, so I believe. The role of education in addressing these contemporary challenges and the future Irish role in shaping humanitarian assistance education. Looking at the contemporary challenges, I want to, to, to draw your attention to, to three issues. And, and I'm not going to go back into the fact that you've heard it from speakers all day, that the huge demand that is there and the potential demand, it's a no-brainer that some changes have to be made. We've heard today that this is going to come from things like climate change, it's going to come from urbanization, and we heard about protracted conflicts. Maybe what we didn't hear about, if, if, if one were to read the works of Homer Dixon and others, the thoughts that because of the, the, the limited or the, the, the pressures on existing resources, the potential for that to turn to violence. And all of these things culminate in, in, in making the challenges huge going forward. The second contemporary challenge I want to bring to your attention, and I, I think Tim referred to the salty uh, argument in the first session, was the whole idea of the decreasing humanitarian space. I would refer to three things. I would refer to politicization, I would refer to marketization, and I'd refer to securitization. And if one wants to read about the reality of these, I, I refer you to, to, to articles by Sarah Collinson, articles more recently by Jacoby and James, which actually say that the big argument about the militarization and aid is only playing second fiddle to the real problem, which is politicization. From that, what I mean is humanitarian action, it is characterized and different, different from development on the basis of, the governing, of its governing principles. And for me, when those principles are regulated, below political interests or below market interests. The problem is 
that saving lives, alleviating suffering, and helping or supporting people live with dignity comes second best. And the humanitarian reach is, I won't say lost, but is considerably reduced. What we didn't hear either today was the whole problem of the security issue. One reason why one of my colleagues aren't here today is because of the, he had lost a colleague very, very recently. And this is a big issue, again, connected with politicization. The third contemporary challenge, I would say, is, and I don't want to mix it up with another concept, is, is the need for more joined up thinking or greater coherence. We heard today about the, the, the huge number of uh, entrants to the field of humanitarian action, both in, both in numbers and scope since the 1990s, and the challenges that are there to try and coordinate all these initiatives. It appears that the hum humanitarian community is, is, is constantly trying to evolve to cope with this. And you heard from Brendan that despite all the evidence that is there, there is little effort to try and anticipate. It is reactive as opposed to proactive. And I would agree with, with, with nearly all of the speakers today that talked about the need for improved disaster risk reduction, improved uh, support to resilience, and also early warning systems. Lastly, what I would say, the big challenge that is out there that wasn't really referred to is the need to increase human resource capacity. There's a very good piece of publication by ANDA about the need for future leadership. And in that case, they're not talking about leaderships as we, leadership as we knew it in the 70s and in the 80s, but rather leadership of 2011, 2012, when the people that are working in the field and the decisions can't be made at a desktop here in headquarters, but you need people who can motivate, people who can manage, people who can, can collect the right type of information, people who can make decisions based on evidence. We heard about the importance of evidence, knowing when to make the decisions and how to make the decisions. Now these are big issues, I think, and the next, challenge, the next problem is to see, well, what part can education, do I think education can play in this? I'm often reminded of a, of a, of a saying of what Oscar Wilde once famously said about education. He said, education is an admirable thing, but it is well to remember from time to time that nothing that is worth knowing can be taught. And when you think of it in some ways humanitarian action, it doesn't fit in to the regular compartments and, and departments and faculties and schools that we have. And, and I think when we reflect to see how humanitarian action, education has evolved from being very closely associated associated to development, to seeing the need as it has arose in reaction to the growth in the 90s, we have tried to develop what I would think is a sense of multidisciplinary, and I would hope interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, humanitarian education. What do I mean? I think that the rationale for interdisciplinary education it stems for a number of underlying assumptions, including the problems being addressed are beyond the scope of any one existing, principle, existing discipline. Pulling together knowledge and skills from existing disciplines will improve the ability to solve the problem. Existing knowledge and skills are relevant to the problem, and these disciplines can share a common problem. Just think of it. We heard today about agriculture, we heard about health, and I believe that there's great research going on in these areas. But in trying to apply them to the problems and the need for a more multicultural approach that addresses the, the bigger problem, this is where we're trying to get to in, in, in humanitarian action. Okay, so, so I'm trying to see well, how, should, how should education do this. I've established a very simple framework based on uh, what, what, what I believe universities should do in line with research, which is about uh, advancing knowledge. Education, or when I talk about education, now I'm talking about teaching, which if I pull from my own university's vision statement, it's about fostering learning in an atmosphere of discovery, creativity, and innovation. And we also have a role in uh, networking 
and, and, and contributing to society, by contributing to the social as well as the economic as well as the cultural society. So if we think back of what the problems were, I think that from, from the universities, we have, uh, uh, well, the great strides that I say have, have, have happened in health, have happened in agriculture, even in peace building and other areas, we need to, to develop those multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams that can make sense of these within the context in which we're working. People were talking about transitions and how do you do transition. It very much depends on the context. It depends on the country. We knew that in Ireland from our own troubles and the situation. And I, I, I'm encouraged to hear Brendan continuously go back and talk that it's in the hands of the people. We can at best support it. We can at best set up that atmosphere or platform to make it happen. But I also think that there's a huge need in research to, to, to challenge. We, we heard one of the speakers at the last session talk about we're doing more of the same or we need to get guys thinking differently. New approaches, new strategies to meet the challenges that, that we know cannot be met when doing, doing more for less. In the area of education, I'm really worried where we're going sometimes in humanitarian action. And I really feel that in some way we're following the road of development. In development, I don't know what it's like here, but in UCD, nearly every faculty in school has to have their own definition of development and their own thinking. I think in humanitarian action, we, we, are, we need to start pulling, pulling heads together. And we also need greater collaboration and improved technologies in, in delivering our education. But there's a lot of work being done, and I think a lot of work has been done that, that we don't really give, give true recognition for in the move away from knowledge transfer to competence-based learning, to improving skills as well as knowledge. And, and I think that this is, this is at the core with regard to leadership as well. Leadership and innovation. And this is what we have to look at, look at in, in, in the way we're approaching the educational process. Lastly, if, if, in our contribution to, to society, if I give you an example and we look at the problems that are there, I, I really believe that the universities, they, they, have, they have the challenge to, to they're mandated to, 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 to question policy and to question if this policy is the betterment of society and global society. And we need in the universities to be more proactive and show that leadership to continue to remind, to remind stakeholders of the moral and legal responsibilities. But I, I might be speaking out of, out of school here. We in education, we also have to be remembered that we shouldn't be allowed to become politicized either. Or we don't allow ourselves to be used uh, or, or by politics, or indeed, we can't allow ourselves to be driven by the market. And nowadays, I don't know, my promotion is going to be probably more focused on how much money I bring in rather than whether I, I'll probably perish and publish at the same time. So these are things we, we, have, to, we have to think about. The one other thing that I would, I would love to, to, I have to point to, and this is work that is very close to my heart and very close to Brendan's heart, is bringing, and I, I'm saying Brendan Cahill or Cahill at this stage, is bringing education outside of the north. Establishing different relationships, greater respect for peer institutions, whether it's in Nairobi, whether it's in Kampala, whether it's in Dar es Salaam, and this is not done just by taking in students for a few months. This is about respecting it and cha changing the relationship we have with professors in, in other institutions. I have to say something here as an Irish man when I've given the opportunity about the famine and, and, and where all this is, is coming from. Um, while my talk has very much been focused in shaping humanitarian action, it is focused on present and contemporary thinking, there's no doubt that our history and our tradition shapes the way we think. While the memory of the famine, it might have little to offer in modern day humanitarian action, it did start off this migration that has provided the Irish education with, with friends and with a gateway and opportunities to be able to collaborate all around the world. I also have to refer to the, the Irish the missionary tradition that has been instrumental in shaping the Irish 
architecture, as we've heard from concern. And we often talk about what has been done in Africa, but it did an awful lot in Ireland as well, with the missionaries coming back, telling us as young lads about the plight of the most vulnerable, and getting people more and more involved in this relief and development debate. And I think we also have to refer to, to, to the advantages we might have with regard to the recent troubles. Because we have first-hand experience of the atrocities of modern-day violence and terror. And it has also provided us with one of the most robust agreements of the era, thanks very much to the efforts of US George Mitchell, not to mention the leap of faith taken by the Clinton White House in the early phase of the peace process. So looking to see the contemporary uh, humanitarian education system in Ireland, I think when you look at it, since the 90s, uh, we have very much mirrored what has happened in Europe. Development and humanitarian assistance was very much the same up until the mid-90s. And in the mid-90s, I suppose the first of our truly humanitarian action programs came in the form of the, the NOAA program in the 19, 19, 1997. Just to tell you what NOAA is, it's a collaboration of nine European universities and eight universities outside Europe. So we deliver a multidisciplinary master's program. Ourselves, along with Uppsala in Sweden, Bochum in Germany, Groningen in Holland, Louvain in Belgium, Aix-en-Provence in France, Eusto in Spain, Warsaw in Poland, and Vilnius in Lithuania. Sharing of education, sharing of thoughts, multicultural. Outside of Europe, we, we benefit from the experience of Columbia University, of Fordham University here in, in New York, but also of the Avariana University in Bogota, of Brasilia University, of University of Western Cape in South Africa, of Makarere University in Uganda, of Monash University in Australia, of Gajamadi University in Indonesia, of Bangalore University in India, and of St. Joseph University in Lebanon. And we have sharing of professors, sharing of ideas. And this is the way we, we hope to, to establish a real meaningful collaboration with, with, these, with these people. So what we have done is, we've, 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 in our program, we've tried to link in not to make it just a UCD program, but we link in with Trinity, we link in with DCU, we link in with Maynooth. But as we have evolved, so too has the humanitarian debate in, in, in Ireland. If you look now, there have been disciplinary different programs set up in all of the main universities. And I'll just draw your attention to the Irish Centre for Human Rights in Galway, the University of Limerick Peace Institute, Trinity Evidence Aid, Aid Initiative, UCC's Program on Hunger, Maynooth's Focus on Development, UCD's Institute on Health and Nutrition, and in Kimmage Development Studies. Now, we're only a small wee island. And the challenge for us, I believe, in moving forward for Ireland, or Ireland and Irish education contributing meaningfully is some joined up thinking, leadership to be taken to pull these people together. And I think UCD is trying to do that in, in, in recently we established the Centre for Humanitarian Action. Our goals are to bring people together and to look to a global constituency, to work with our partners towards changing our philosophy towards working with people. And this will we do with establishing joint master's programs, joint PhD programs, delivering summer schools with colleagues like Brendan Hare, and also using Brendan's expertise from Fordham to come over and share summer schools in Ireland. And these are the kind of positive initiatives, I think, that, 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 that UCD and Irish universities can, can make. In conclusion, what I would say is that all the indicators suggest that the global humanitarian assistance required is going to, 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 to worsen before it gets better. There is a real need for everyone to realize in our increasingly global world that assisting the most vulnerable is in all of our interests. The growing numbers and resource availability to help the most vulnerable while increasing on year to year are not keeping pace with the humanitarian demand. Basically, we need to improve efficiencies in the existing system 
And even that is not enough. We need to bring new thinking to the table while utilizing the existing resources. The universities and the institutions can, I think, may make a huge contribution to this, but they have to move, like was said earlier, to a more proactive rather than reactive approach in assisting this. Thank you very much.
kind of delayed recognition of some of this in Irish cultural history, and it is having a somewhat delayed impact on Irish cultural studies um, at the same time. Now, I'm interested in the fact that um, uh, while higher education is somewhat in a state of turmoil and a big shakeout of one kind or another right now, I think very much the Irish studies is as well. I mean, we need to go no further really than that Fintan O'Toole's dispatches on a regular basis about how globalization has ended the distinction between Irish and foreign, and we can no longer talk about Irish literature any more than we can talk about Irish theater, let alone Irish economy or Irish bank, which would be a lot harder to talk about at the same time, too. Uh, now, this it really um, is very evident in, in the way Irish studies uh, and literary and historical ways have proceeded for a long time. A lot of, a lot of you know a great deal, particularly in, uh, say, historic historiography, how quickly um, Irish historical studies proceeded to revisionisms, as if we were losing out the first step and moving right into that. I've been very interested in the history of, of Irish literary studies. I think very much from uh, in the 20th century, and it's very distinguished history and whatnot. Uh, it began out of a certain kind of defensiveness about the artistry of Irish writers in comparison with their uh, counterparts in a much more storied and canonized kind of literature from the other region, the Chaucer to Shakespeare to Dickens kind of regional literature. And we were very, very defensive about that. And so we focused almost entirely on the artistic quality in order to demonstrate the equality of the Irish writers with their English counterparts. Then, of course, very quickly we proceeded on to the Irish, the vast superiority of the Irish writers to all of the English ones at the same time, at the same time, too. And that has really given us very much what I think of as, uh, as the uh, Yeats and Joyce and Samuel Beckett that we have today, which were not at all the only Yeats's and Joyce's and Samuel Beckett's that we could, that we could possibly have at this time. And as, a, as a putting together some notes for this talk, too, I thought I would sort of think about in some ways um, one of the pinnacles of uh, Irish studies right now are three recent biographies of William Butler Yeats, James Joyce, and Samuel Beckett, uh, immense books. And thinking about today's meeting, I, I've checked, and I, I'm interested to see that humanitarianism, or any of its many cognate terms, never appear in any of the indexes of those books. And that is how we have created a kind of a Yeats and a Joyce and a Beckett that we wanted right now. Now, another way to reference what we're talking about here today was you know, the old Marxist, uh, Terry Eagleton, very, very loudly recently has, has complained. He says, he says, where is the famine in the literature of the revival? And he's gone about a critique of uh, Irish revival and especially recent scholarship of it that is emphasizing, say, the mythic creations of epic Ireland over the actual traditions of deprivation and other kinds of things that are really embedded, embedded very much in it. And then in conjunction with that turmoil in higher education, turmoil in Irish studies, I'm very happy to hear other people today, Brenda Rogers very much too, talking about some of the issues facing humanitarian affairs right now, tactics, strategies, the kinds of things that we heard in the last two last two panels. There are many more in the room, much more knowledgeable about that than me. But I'm interested, always the opportunist, interested if there are you know, three interesting areas in interesting turmoil if some opportunity and some synthesis uh, might come out of that. But as an example, let me, <clears throat> let me go back to Eagleton's question. Where is the famine in the literature of the Bible? And the answer plainly, and the answer is that it is, that it's, it is hiding in plain sight that uh, the Irish literary revival, more than any other event, um, has to be tied to the opening of William Butler Yeats' play called The Countess Kathleen in Dublin in 1899. And so the Irish literary revival really began with a play that was very much literally, not in any figurative way at all, about wealth, poverty, poverty philanthropy, charity, famine, and superism. This was the initial event of 
It was just that our focus has taken us elsewhere. And so even when this play is talked about these days, we mostly talk about, you know, the achievement of Yeats's highest style rather than any documentary quality that the literature might have or any reference to this kind of blocked episode in the, uh, in the cultural history. Um, so then, um, so if it was the cultural imperative at one earlier point in the 20th century to ground all the literary rev revival and the study of it in artistry, now it might be possible to do things quite differently. And I think if Kathleen Houlihan had been looked at in terms of the histor history of the famine and hunger and deprivation, uh, it would give us uh, a different kind of Yeats and a different kind of way to proceed in how we study Irish literature, what it is in Irish literature that we bring forward. Um, in, in this respect, for example, I think it might be very interesting if we studied Yeats much, much more as the uh, is the figure about humanitarianism and about anti-censorship and all the other kinds of things that happened. Of James Joyce, really, in terms of the survivor of two European world wars, and of Samuel Becker really taking his final shape as an outcome of the second of those world wars, too. Um, now that might be, you know, a very far call from the kind of humanitarian action that we've heard of recently, but I think it can be a related and, and complementary kind of development in, in, in advancing Ireland, we've heard it today, in particular in its relation to humanitarian uh, traditions. And if, and if focusing uh, 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 the future of pupils on particular targets, I think that that is something that we can provide in relation to the things we talked about today. And that would go a great deal further. That would go a great way in reassuring people about the value of higher education at a time when people have become extraordinarily skeptical about what it all is. And then finally, you know, the, the, uh, the, the commercial has to enter into, it, enter into it in some way. So I'm very happy to say that uh, in this building, uh, on July 11th, we will have the Druid Theatre Company here in conjunction with their production of the Tom Murphy plays um, at Lincoln Center in the month of July as part of the Lincoln Center Festival. And in particular, we are going to be having a program on the Tom Murphy play Famine, which until now really has always been talked about, like Patrick Kavanaugh's poem, always been talked about in terms of the cultural history of the decades when they were composed. Uh, and instead, uh, and instead of artistry, we're going to discuss these in terms of the cultural memory of famine and hunger immigration will be joined by Maureen Murphy, who uh, we have heard today about the Lower Manhattan Famine Memorial and also the, the, uh, the famine curriculum that's part of the New York State curriculum right now, all developed by, by Maureen Murphy. So everybody here is invited and, uh, and uh, I'd be interested in seeing what kind of discussion we begin then in the cultural history. She is, amongst other things, co-chair of Glucksman Ireland House, which, as you may know, is the Centre for Irish Studies uh, at NYU at New York University. Um, she also, with her husband, established the Glucksman Chair of Irish and Scottish Studies at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. In 2007, University College Cork saw the official opening of the Lewis Glucksman Gallery, a wonderful building. If you ever get that way, I do suggest you, you visit. Uh, she also serves on numerous other boards, including the IDA, the National Gallery of Ireland, Trinity College, 
the University College of Cork and the Royal College of Surgeons, and least uh, I used to be forgotten, I would throw in the Smurfit School of Business there as well. It should be there. <laughs> um, early in her career, uh, Loretta was producer for news and public affairs with PBS TV. She was also a lecturer in English literature at several universities. I started out with the same career, just sharing that information. Tim really re referred to Loretta as, I think, a, a leader uh, in the community. I think that's a very good phrase, but only if that community is understood as the tribe, the 70 million. So we welcome you as one of the leaders of that tribe. Thank you for joining us today. sort of like uh, having to look at your first Holy Communion pictures when someone reads a uh, <laughs> CD like that. So thank you for truncating it. Me and that was fine. You guys are the true believers. I, I thank you for your perseverance and I applaud your, uh, your resilience. Uh, it's been a long day, but uh, I hope a fruitful one and I'm very grateful that you have come in there because this panel, I think, to sort of wrap up some of the discussions that you have been working on all day. Um, I was saying to Liam that I am, I can still consider myself uh, an educator, although I am very fallen away. Uh, but I would like to speak uh, about my current role in philanthropy, not only as it applies to education, and it certainly does, but overall as it perhaps it applies to the uh, me larger question of humanitarian uh, work. Uh, philanthropy in Ireland is, as we all know, pretty much in its infancy, uh, especially relative to the United States. But a very important um, semantic point is philanthropy does not mean generosity. The Irish have always been generous, sometimes to a fault for their own well-being. So I'm talking about pure um, science, if you will, of philanthropy, not generosity. Just a few stats, because they are germane, even though I usually detest them. In the United States, philanthropic giving equates to 2% of our GDP, $300 billion a year, 85% of which comes from individuals and families, 10% from corporations, and 5% from foundations. In Ireland, Roughly 0.7% of GDP is given away, high by the European average of 0.4%, but of course low compared to the United, the United States figure. In addition, most of the Irish philanthropy is now done by corporations and companies. So philanthropy in Ireland is smaller and sort of represents a mirror image of the United States pattern. In fact, though, the Irish are renowned for their generosity. Historically, as we know, most of that was either structured by or driven by the church in um, early Ireland, even before the, the Free State. The church sort of managed the charitable giving of Ireland. Now, uh, actually, even back then, responses in giving in Ireland are situational, if you will. They are driven by responses to famine or natural disasters in the developing world. There are other stats, which I'm not going to give you today, about the percentage of Irish giving when there are worldwide um, crises. The Irish are always among the top five national givers. This reactive giving is best described as charity, while planned giving is the essence of philanthropy. Again, that sounds semantic, but it is not. Philanthropy is much more uh, targeted, it's much more structured than, and I'm not denigrating charity by any means because if people didn't have charitable impulses, there would be no philanthropy. But the urgency that Irish people respond to is basically charity, where when there is a long strategic plan <coughs> set up, that's where we get into philanthropy. Until giving in Ireland increases significantly, I have to emphasize again the great progress that has been made. And individual donors give more and on a planned basis. The dependence on United States philanthropic giving will remain. Uh, I see that curve <coughs> flattening out 
much more rapidly than I would have 20 years ago when I started our work with the uh, American Ireland Fund. The Irish have, as they very often do, have proven to be very quick studies, and they are adopting the models of philanthropy much more quickly than anyone would have thought. Our own experience with Ireland is, is pretty bullish, as I've said. Uh, as Liam alluded, we, the American Ireland Fund, uh, Fund put in place a Promising Ireland campaign in uh, 2009. It was meant to culminate in 2013, and we pledged to raise $100 million for uh, projects in Ireland. Thursday last, we were thrilled to announce that 19 months ahead of schedule, we have already raised $120 million. Now, that's something that could take an all-day forum to examine. I would love to get into the, the real nitty-gritty of why. How, how did that happen? I, it happened with a lot of slogging hard work. That's one thing. But what is it about Ireland that would allow such a phenomenon in a very, very difficult climate. There is something to be examined there, and I'll file that with Brendan for, uh, for, for future, future fora. Irish aid agencies need to distinguish themselves as the best in the field, and they are across the board to do that, providing the greatest return on the philanthropic dollar and offering an experience that can be emulated by others. We in the Ireland Funds have a process of uh, following a donation with agencies, and this is not just humanitarian agencies, but they have just amazed us with how they adapt to new <coughs> formulations of uh, transparency and responsibility. We have, in the beginning, 20 years ago, there, we got into some dicey situations. We never have in the last 10 years. The agencies that we deal with are highly professional. They need very little um, observation, and they have come a long way in a very, very short period of time. There is not still enough in Ireland of uh, tactical cooperation among agencies. The age-old Irish way of the first thing we do is have the split. Um, we're getting there, though, and I would like to to commend concern, um, Tom, for your work with the Gates Foundation. That's the model that I would love to have so many other agencies look at. I mean, it's groundbreaking, and it, it speaks to the value of concerns track record, of course, but it also was very innovative on your part to go after something like that. You can't get much more prestigious than the Gates Foundation, and they can't get much more prestigious than getting concerned. I am very proud of the work that we do with Irish organizations. Um, we hope to continue that work. Uh, our fundraising is really, I believe, going from strength to strength. And although in the beginning I thought, I'm not sure how to mold what I want to say into something that will be relevant to a discussion of humanitarianism, except then I reflected again as an fallen away English teacher the essence of humanitarianism is caring for others. And so philanthropy can kind of ease its way into that category, I think. Thank you. Well, since everyone's sitting, I'm going to sit as well. But from here, I can see you all. So if you'd like to ask a question, you have to start us off. Everybody's exhausted. <laughs> Education, culture, philanthropy, ticket pay. Yes, thank you. Well, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, that's, we'll, we'll all hear that. Thank you again for this group also. And then the issue of culture and, and philanthropy and bringing people together from our, actually, the mental health education organization I work with, Next Gen, which is on the front of uh, in the National Society of General Submittings, brings up the importance of uh, on better communication and better cooperation. One of the things I know I've found that the UN and 
our different agencies seem to be weak on the development of cultures which are great, more cooperative, less um, demonization of the other, and actually respect. I think you spoke of that also, uh, and ways of working uh, not just nationally but regionally, which is something the World Economic Forum seems to be so far ahead of, frankly, our own U.S. Administrations and uh, politics here. Maybe the European is, is better, but uh, the importance of culture and how we can work together to develop better cultures and better intergovernmental capacity building. Is there some questions? Uh, let, let's have a perhaps we can put this together. Yeah, uh, yeah I would like to ask. question. Uh, I have a project, it's, it's, it's a pilot project in place. Maybe if we come back in three years, we'll be able to tell you if it's working. In setting up the center, and based on the concept of multidisciplinary and multicultural, I pulled together four very interesting students. Brendan knows them. One is an Indian who's a uh, Masters, he has masters from Jadapur and Uppsala University and has just finished a PhD with me on politics. I have a British lady who is an uh, anthropologist and theology, and she's from Cambridge University. I have an American who did a master's with us from environmental studies, and I have an Irish guy who did law and sociology in the London School of Economics. And I'm treating my humanitarian program the same way as the medic might treat their interdisciplinary team. If you have a cancer, you need a holistic view. The same way as if you want to look at what's going on in Syria, if you want to look at what's going on in Northern Ireland, if you want to go on, look at any of these and forensically examine it and see what's going on, you need those kind of people that can give you direction from the teaching. And I, I believe that that is the way we're going. So. Maybe if we come back in two years' time, they'll tell you either I'm dead or they will be dead, but we'll see the way it works and how we think it. With regards to your own question, Ambassador, I, I think it's, 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 a key, it's a key issue. I, I, I think that when we talk about a change in thinking, I talk about the, the human resource capacities that need to, 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 to shift. And when we're thinking about the, the competencies that people need, I think I'm all the time asked by people, well, am I not training students for the jobs that Tom and Gold and whatever are sending? And if they want carpenters or want this or want that, we all have to start to discuss together and come around the table and think what way are we going in the future? I believe what we need is, 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 is leaders that respect what is going on. Give me, let me give you an example. I have a challenge at times with people that, that go out building houses. Because if, if somebody, Ireland is on a downturn at the moment, if I saw a load of Sudanese coming in to build houses in my town, where all the builders are unemployed, I, I, have, I have problems with that. So I think we need different people, and we need people that are, are, are doing a job, and, and edu working with the educational system. This is why myself and Brendan are now running programs in South Africa, in. Uh, Uganda, and, and this is where we, we'd like to think that, that, that this is the way forward. Could I just respond to Ambassador too? Let's say that uh, I think that uh, Fordham in particular, and actually American higher education, much more than is generally recognized, is, is not at all as focused on business as it seems to, to, to be, really, from most of the media attention to it. And I think that, I mean, in our students, certainly, uh, um, there's a very, very big demand for international studies, one of the fastest growing majors in this building actually at Lincoln Center. Uh, 
Um, we still do language requirements. Uh, we, we still do international political economy and development as subject areas. We are doing very much on our undergrad. I'll leave Brendan and Pat to talk about graduate degrees, but we're doing this very much on the, on the undergraduate level. Students really respond to it very, very, very strongly. Um, and, and I think it's encouraging. And, and uh, I think getting a little bit closer to it, you really see a lot of direct engagement with, uh, with, with students today in international studies of the world, the world around them. Uh, and not just a Euro-American world, but a, but a broader world around them. If I may follow up on that, and sort of switching hands a little bit. Um, Fordham's program in Irish studies is, is the, the gold standard, in my opinion, and uh, we're, we at NYU are very much new kids on the block, so we watch Fordham carefully and, and have learned a great deal. One of the things, to Ambassador's point, that I think is a huge uh, and very fun outcome of this sort of little tiny Ireland being part of a global experiment is Ireland House, we uh, have a huge interest in the language, in Gaelic language. And I sit in on the class sometimes, and the most wonderful thing is to watch Chinese kids speaking Gaelic. <laughs> it is true, it just assures you that there is a, a global connection somewhere. Yes, we've got two, three Hi. questions. Briefly, I just wanted to thank the panel because it may be the great graveyard shift <laughs> that in fact you've managed to stimulate a very interesting discussion. And I think uh, just in terms of the, the points that John made, initially when you started to speak, I was wondering, well, where is the humanitarian that is going to come in here? But I think it is really important because as we do try to build a narrative about Ireland and our tradition of, of uh, uh, our history of famine and our emphasis our policy, foreign policy priorities around hunger, it is really important not just to look back to the famine from a historical perspective, but also to look at some of those cultural dimensions. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, and, and, to be, and to be part of the main narrative and not to become a counter narrative. Absolutely. And just in relation to, uh, also thank you to Loretta, I think there's some really important points that you made in terms of the distinctions between philanthropy and charity. Um, and I just think that there are possibly also some very important lessons that can be shared, as you said, perhaps at a, at a future forum, in terms of how you approach, uh, perhaps from more a business model, in terms of how you uh, attract uh, <coughs> people who are going to invest in philanthropic concerns, your expectations around results and accountability and transparency. I think it's an interesting discussion that we, as the more traditional donors, could have with people such as yourself. And um, I also think another perhaps interesting angle to look at for the future might be around lessons to be learned from you around, uh, you know, if you, if you look at many of the African countries that you work in, uh, remittances from the diaspora are a hugely important part of, of revenue being generated in these countries. There is a growing middle class, as has been mentioned, there's growing business interests and also some very successful diaspora groups in many parts of the world that could be, uh, you know, I think that so, so there could be a very useful conversation as well in terms of the work that you've been doing for Ireland uh, and uh, how we can also harness some of the lessons from that for diaspora groups uh, for African countries, for example. So thank you very much. Oh, please. Do you mind, Charlie? Is There is a lot of talk about using the diaspora, and Tim has been charged by the government to uh, run this gathering for 2013. Is it 2013? Yeah. Uh, to try to harness the power of the diaspora. So there's, there's huge interest in it. But what we keep saying is that there's also an economic component to it. It accrues huge, or it could accrue huge economic benefits by, and I don't mean just uh, canvassing and saying, would you ever send five, five euros over? Uh, and we, a couple of years ago, put together this Imagine Ireland project, Culture Ireland, and we can prove that there is an economic component to supporting culture. And again, I commend John on what you're doing with Druid. That's huge. That's way past anything we would be able to touch. Uh, to put that work on, Tom Murphy, That is going to have amazing economic returns, not just in Ireland, but here also. Uh, so I think that we have to get more hard 
important economic It's been a fascinating adventure for me and a voyage for me as I've done it all and to be part of this. Uh, over the last three years, we've really been pulling together work by artists in Ireland, particularly uh, visual artists, sculptors, uh, Rowan Gillespie, John Eaton, and others. And I'm very proud to say that Quinnipiac uh, are also the sponsor of the World Tour of Druids, uh, fan uh, of the play. And, uh, you know, so it's part of that. But the point I wanted to to that speaks really to what you're we talking about the generosity of not just the Irish, but the generosity of other people. Uh, could it be I got involved with John Leahy uh, about three, uh, 15 years ago when the Irish government decided to commemorate the family, about 17 years ago almost now, uh, when they first uh, went after the Black 47, the commemorations were. And uh, two of the main funders, philanthropists involved in Quinnipiac, said to uh, President Leahy, you know, we really, uh, the Jewish family, the lenders of Lenders Bagels, those of us who live in America are aware of, the Lenders family said, we are so moved by this story of the family that we knew nothing about. It. And we, uh, you know, we, we know our story, we know the Holocaust, we know nothing about the Irish family. We encourage you to tell this story. That thus began the collection and today will lead to, uh, in September, lead to the museum. And that to me is so significant that it took a Jewish family, you know, to, 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 to jumpstart what has become a huge uh, uh, project. I had the good fortune uh, about a month ago to have lunch with Tom Keneally, the wonderful Australian writer who, is, uh, who wrote the Chimpers List and who has written the book that was referred to earlier Three Families. And I told Tom the story about the Landers. And Murray Lander had just died that we, we met. And uh, Tom uh, inscribed his books, uh, his book that we gave him to uh, the widow and to uh, another brother, Marvin, who was involved in it. And he inscribed the book uh, to, uh, to the Landers, saying, we tell each other's stories. And he had told the Shippenstead story, and they were helping to tell the Irish family story, the Great Hunger story. And I think that's kind of, to me, generosity that's not only in philanthropy, but it's certainly a cultural generosity that comes out as well. And so I, it's, today has been thrilling, but to end on this note for me has been just really quite remarkable. Well said, Joe. Very nice. Good, good, yeah. What's up? I'd just like to follow up, but that's very powerful intervention, Carla. And uh, I'd just like to ask, I think it's brilliant that we're finishing on the culture piece. Uh, because I, I understand John's struggle to say, well, how is, how is this going to fit in? But actually, this is a human journey. And at the, day, at the end of the day, the famine and hunger are actually human tragedies with, with long-lasting, probably, you know, legacies uh, on the individual themselves and into families. But what I want to just throw up in the, uh, in the you know, following on from what Loretta was saying about uh, what they're doing at NYU at the Ireland House in terms of teaching the Irish language, well, one of the... One of the questions, I'm not sure what the word to put on it is, and the scholars can maybe decide what the word is, is it a tragedy? But we in our, one of the pieces that happened to us in Ireland, apart from famine, and maybe connected to famine, is the loss of a language. So, question, what does it mean to be a country, to be a people that, 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 uh, that have lost a language that was two and a half thousand years the spoken tongue of, of that? What does that mean? Um, in terms of a, of a society that goes forward uh, after that. And, and the role of the family, again, I'm not quite sure myself, I'm not a, especially of a scholar to know the site, but I just know that something, and when, when Tom Murphy's plays are going to be put on, 
three of them together, folks. Three planes of Tom Murphy and Drew. Do not expect a soft, fluffy experience. This is going to be challenging. But in a rift, absolutely. This is going to take me off it. But it is very challenging and it's going to be very challenging for and it also speaks to the whole relationship between the tribe who stay behind and the tribe who goes. I don't think that's easy either. But in the middle of that, so and I believe it is deeply relevant what we're talking about, in the middle of it is language and the loss of language. And I would be interested to hear the views of uh, of, 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 of Red and, and John and Pat in terms of that piece of this journey. I agree with what Red has said, just such a broad kind of a thing, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to answer to. I mean, certainly you're right that the Murphy play is really sort of trace the trauma of what was there. I'm very excited about the Murphy plays coming um, this summer because they haven't really been given a fair shot in America. You know, they're, they're much more produced in Ireland and in Britain than they are in America. Um, and so this will be, a, 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 this, as you say, will bring a grittier kind of vision. To, to American audiences, and I think that that is very, very important. I think that in, in, the, in the larger sense that what we're talking about, humanitarian interest in, in, in Ireland and elsewhere, and models that can be taken and applied elsewhere, that there are other cultural traumas associated with language loss elsewhere in the world too. And Ireland you know, has, has the great, one of the great historical examples to be able to point to. Then its impact, the impact of its absence on, on, on the current culture and the literature and, and the other things that go with it. There is tremendous uh, interest in it, both NYU and Fordham. We have a lot of students actively pursuing study of Irish language. And, and, um, and that, that is coming through along with the, the literature, theater, um, music, and other areas. So, so I think it's very visible. It is a kind of Irish exceptionalism, I think, that is generally recognized. This, this cultural trauma, and I think that that's a big part of the story. Two notes, one here and then one here.
question. What do you think about engaging with uh, Cardinal Dolan and the Board of and other academic communities on a need to engage more constructively in uh, the values and why we follow it, probably in the system that we create, the economic system is counterproductive. Uh, I put forward to you. How can the only approach Soros and his colleagues also say? Market only rule does not provide a great efficiency. Uh, let me go to Pat Gibbons on that. The reason is, Pat, one of the things you said, as I recall, is that we shouldn't, as educators, be led either by politics or the market. Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a pitch for sin food, I think. Nonetheless, how would you follow that up? How do you do that? I think it's well, with, with the, the, the last question with regard to culture and, and, and language, I, I'm also doing a wee bit of work in Northern Ireland, and uh, we're looking at the reconciliation up there. And we, there are huge challenges there. We, we, we best not look at all of this with ropes and glasses either. And we see the same situation, the challenges we have in, in Northern Uganda and other places. Uh, the whole reconciliation process, integration process, that there's, is, is a very complex, very, very complex area. Um, regards to uh, the, the last issue there, sorry, Liam, the direct question? Um, if you like, it's an ethical question. Um, how do you, as an educator, steer clear of political or market forces when you're functioning to give some kind We're talking about keeping uh, humanitarian assistance clear. I was, I was, I was answering that in the, in the whole context of the, the politicization of our, our so called politicization of, of, of aid. Um, and it's a pity today we didn't have, have Jeff Lone here, who is, who is a real expert on, on the principles. But the, the whole idea, I, I, I was referring back to the whole idea that, back to the, the humanitarian action, that uh, invariably, it has to be, be, be or it's, it's supposed to be, and somehow impartial based on, on, on need, and, and the need alone, and don't discriminate. Uh, similarly, um, there, there are increasing pressures, I think, to become instruments where governments have certain ideas, and, and, and they, they look at you as instruments to, to be able to, 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 to direct their, their particular aid. I think you have to, uh, be somehow ethical and philosophical about it, and not be driven in those in, in, in those ways. Uh, uh, can I, uh, I? I think the engagement that you're talking about is happening right now. I mean, we have Obama at the Barnard College of Columbia University today. We've got a number of other. Each of all of these events are surrounded by demonstrations. I think that's engagement. I can tell you, we're going to do it. Well, we're going to do Fordham this week, and I can tell you where the demonstration is on Friday, where it is on Saturday, and where it is on Sunday too. And I'll even sort of explain my confidence that this is what the universities do. Really, is that as that I will steal a line from my president, Father McShane, too, because one of the things he will be saying, which he in fact stole from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, was he was answering the question, "How do you start a great city?" And uh, Morning Ahead and now McShane said, well, you start a university and you come back in 200 years. And so I think this fermenting is going on here. The politics will be a good thing, though. It, it is a good thing, yeah, yes. It is a good thing. Constructive politics. We'll agree on that. Oh, sorry. The Jesuits have a little bit of history in politics. <laughs> <laughs> Probably best not to open that one just now. Um, there's a question here. Hi, uh, John Bob here. I was just hoping to get your impressions uh, and thoughts on this increasing trend in higher education toward online digitalization. Um, just last week, uh, the front page of the Boston Globe, the announcement was that now Harvard and MIT will be offering free public courses uh, available to the general public, um, along with classroom tools um, and other online resources. Um, how do you see that? In, uh, impacting, I guess, culture in general, uh, higher education in general, and then maybe also uh, specifically humanitarian affairs, um, as well as maybe philanthropy. Good question. Great question. Very good question. Over to you, 
Which, which is to say he's taking it. Well, I'm, I'm sort of absorbing the free online classes, because all it took was MIT and Harvard had to put in 60 million, and then they became free and online <laughs> courses. Um, but you're true. I mean, it, it's a very exciting time. Uh, I'm also very involved in Fordham in our Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. And we are increasingly using online education in these areas, which might not be the first areas where you would think about online education. I mean, some of the promises of, of it is the reach that it gives you, the distance, um, the, the different kinds of communities and, and, and um, constituencies that you can reach into. Uh, and I think that that is all, that's got wonderful and it will be like a lot of other things that we see, it will live up to its potential or it will not. I remember when internet was new about how it was going to be a totally commercial free kind of zone in which there wouldn't be no profit taking at all. It didn't turn out to be exactly like that. And I think where distance education will go is really very exciting. And you're, you know, you're in the middle of it right now. We are watching this happen. Uh, the outcome is not clear. I think it certainly is very, very worth watching and very pleased. Just to, on the point of philanthropy, I don't have a clue where it's going to take us. Um, and it's not because we don't study it and look at it, because it is hugely important in all areas of our society, because it's going to drive the way we interact with one another, whether we like it or not. Uh, but it, it's a great question to ask, and again, when Brendan has his next already doing this, we've been doing it for the last three or four years, we started with trying to, to share Blackboard lectures, and, and we found it was very interesting, especially um, in, in trying to cross the divide between seven different countries in Europe, and the big difficulty we had initially was to have the facility, uh, the practicalities of organizing these lectures when, when we were, were having interactive lectures uh, with, with, with uh, key lectures. But there's quite a, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, work then in providing the required tutoring and follow-up. It, it, it's a work in progress. It's not just as easy and it's, there's nothing free in that level, especially when you're talking about students where you're encouraging debate they want more than just a lecture. They want then necessarily follow up. So this new system requires a little bit more strategic thinking. Uh, and it's something that, it, that, that we have been working on. But I personally think it is, it, it's a most, it's, a, it's, it's the way to go. Do you have any comment yourself? I'm sitting here with my iPad. Uh, so you know, that says yeah. um, I've actually, uh, there's this thing called iTunes U came out a little while ago. Been downloading these free uh, talks from uh, people like yourselves and, and just learning a lot, a lot. And the quality uh, seems to be great. And now, I guess, in conjunction with this effort to also provide some chat rooms now and forum. And, and not, maybe that's not uh, any, any replacement for the kind of experience you would get here. But I, I was just wondering if the effects on the sort of democratization uh, of, of higher education, they used to be so specialized. you're in a good spot because really I think that as this generation grows into the uh, management of our society, I, I think when we look back, it's going to be such a watershed period for not just culture, not just technology, but across the board. I don't think any time in history uh, has the pace of change been as rapid as it is today. Take the opportunity to arrive. 
quite simple. What does it matter to you about these technological changes and doing what you do? I mean, after all, an iPad has been held here. It's probably not being held by many students in the region that you're trying to reach. So the technology is a, is a big issue, isn't it? And presumably it's evolution is something you have to keep an eye on. Is that right? Well, I mean, the, the home growth of mobile phones wasn't a famine, and we never claimed it was a famine. <laughs> Tom, you really made that point. Yeah, I did. But uh, the point was we also tried to learn from that experience in 2005, and we commissioned a, an anthropological study in about Niger, uh, which was done in early 2006, and it, it revealed some very, very important underlying cultural issues, which explained why the food, cri the food crisis was as bad as it was. And it was absolutely not about a very serious shortage of food. It was about many of the underlying cultural reasons and realities of that society. So when four or five years later, it appeared that there was a, an emerging food crisis in 2010, and that was fairly clear from the failed harvest of the previous year, we were designing a new, a different type of program. And the, there were three elements to it. I mean, one was the traditional nutrition intervention, where you tried to catch children who were heading towards significant malnutrition and intervene before they got there. The second one was trying to make sure that the farmers had the relevant <coughs> inputs for the next harvest, which was the planting season was about to be uh, coming up in a couple of months' time. The third one was a distribution of cash to identify the poor families. But this cash was going to be distributed by mobile phone. And so I happened to be there when the mobile phones were being distributed out. And many of the people receiving them were women, older women. And they were learning very quickly. So, but they were getting the mobile phone and they were, the immediate purpose was to, to allow them to receive cash in an efficient way. Then they were going to be using those mobile phones for very other, many other reasons. And one of the very practical reasons was that they were going to be able to communicate with their husbands and their sons who were migrated to Abidjan and to other coastal areas. And there are many other examples of how you know, technology is, is, it has the potential, I think, to really fast forward, develop some, uh, some development practice. And that's, that's just one of the dimensions to it. Yeah, great stuff. Um, yes. Just about linking the, the, the technology debate, it's, it's like the question you asked before. I think that we are supposed in the universities, we're, we're, we're supposed to encourage debate and academic and rigor and thinking. But just to give you a, an example of the students and, and the innovation, uh, I suppose, that, that, that they lay at your table at times. I had students from, it was actually Spain recently, who were looking for support and they too had been encouraged, and we were encouraging this idea of leadership and innovation thinking. 
and they were looking for support. Are you familiar with headaches? Uh, now this is this is the whole. Uh, are, are many people, is everybody familiar with headaches? No. Okay. But this is getting getting people headaches. To headaches. Headaches. So yeah, and the Red Cross have been involved in headaches and, and, and a lot of other organisations where you bring in uh, these people who are seen to be very good presenters or have something innovative and, and one thinking and they have organised and and, and and went to collect funding to bring these eight people together in one venue to give their presentations of whatever it is, 16 or 18 minutes within a particular area, and they have rallied around all of the students to create their, their lectures. I'm just showing this as, as an example that this is where the students are at. at, at we had different methods years ago to monitor and to evaluate and see how things are going on. Now it's Facebook and social media, it's all other kinds of things. And we have to embrace the technology through the lectures as well. Yep. Just to make a brief point to, to follow up, I mean, just another practical example. I was just last week in Geneva and I was meeting with people from the International Committee for the Red Cross. And we were asking issues about humanitarian access in, in, in Syria. And uh, in particular, we're discussing the Iraqi refugee population that are in different camps throughout the country. And I was really taken with the response that access wasn't a problem because money was being transferred electronically to many of these refugees because it's a long-standing humanitarian engagement. And so physical access was no longer a challenge because the markets were still functioning to a certain extent and uh, through electronic means. However, just a word of caution. I mean, it is fantastic, and we need to, to uh, of course, to promote, and there's real possibilities and potential for democratizing education through uh, IT. But we have to remember that for many, many countries, they are so far behind. The example was given earlier about very often the best intervention you can put in is a road. Or, or for many, many communities, 60% of some countries, the population are two days' walk from a decent road. You have many communities that don't have access to electricity or running water. And so then to talk about uh, the, the use of IT in that kind of, it's not that we need to wring our hands in despair and give up. We need to move it. But there's also real risks of a digital divide that what we're actually doing is uh, thinking that this is going to solve our problems, but creating yet uh, further obstacles to, for ordinary people to, to, to progress and develop. So some of the challenges are still very, very basic, uh, and so we have a long way to go before ICT will become the answer to, to many of those challenges. All I wanted to say is that you know within a, within a symposium, you always have to lead somewhere. And uh, for both Pat and I, uh, humanitarian education is a very wide umbrella. But I, I think that at the very heart of it, really is, is culture, generosity, and philanthropy, uh, which, as Loretta really beautifully said, are two very different things, but that strategy. And the other thing is, is the dignity. So I, I think when you look at the Irish example, it's very often keeping that human at the, at the middle of humanitarianism because of uh, their own experiences and how they see themselves within the world. So I just want to thank this panel also for you know, taking us through to the very end and the last baton of where we go. I could not sum it up any better. I think that's perfect. So shall we just thank this panel? Um, if you'll lend me a couple of minutes, I will wrap up. And I promise it's brief. This really is the graveyard shift. When you're, you're doing a bit of a wrap. Excuse me. To be honest, the key reason I want to do this is to say a couple of thanks as much as anything else. Uh, my first thank you has to go to Brandon Cahill, um, but it has to at the same time go to Tim O'Connor. Uh, Tim is a rather magical matchmaker, as we're hearing. This is the well-known, ubiquitous Tim O'Connor, as he will always be. Uh, Tim uh, led me by the hand around the streets of New York about 18 months ago, literally at times. <laughs> and one of the people he introduced me to was the person who runs this university. And in that conversation, sitting between the three of us, there was a suggestion, oh, you've got to talk to Brendan Cable. So I get back home and I think the emails ensued.
conversations ensued, and here we are today, Brendan. So, first of all, thanks to Tim for being the matchmaker, uh, and Brendan, thanks for being a good match. It's been good to see you. Uh, I also have to say a particular thanks to Catherine, where she hiding? She's here somewhere, sure. Yes, she is hiding. And Jenna, where's Jenna? And Jenna, thank you. I know others have been working behind the scenes, both at UCD and here as well, so thank you to, to all of you. And a really big thanks to everyone, particularly those who stayed the course, for two things. First, for salty discussion, as I think it's been from the off. And secondly, for giving us at least six other forums that we can now run. I've been scribbling them down every time they come. I don't know if you've kept it kind as well, Brendan, but we're well set for another six years at this point. Yeah. Pretty good. Okay, and I will be brief. Um, the scale and impact of Irish contribution to humanitarian action is remarkable, as I think we've observed today, for a small nation, or as Pat called it, and I would call it coming from up north, a weak country. Though this contribution has, I think, uh, through this contribution, Ireland, I think we can say, has become a, a principled actor on the global stage. And of particular note, as we've heard today, is the exceptional role it plays in the fight against global hunger. Now, this has often been acknowledged, but I think it's fair to say less often uh, reflected upon closely. This conference has provided an opportunity to discuss the history of this role and consider its present and future challenges and opportunities. Brendan Rogers got us off to a very good start with a fulsome, measured, insightful reflection on the past, present, and promise of Ireland's role in humanitarian assistance. Many of Brendan's points, as we've all heard, were picked up in the discussions of the panels. As we heard in the first panel, Ireland's present role in humanitarian assistance is due in no small part to our history as a small nation dealing with the impact and legacies of famine. But already I'm thinking of putting this word famine in inverted commas, because one of the things I learned today from the first session is we have to be careful about how to use this term, and how to think about how it's used and abused. And I think that was a very valuable discussion that came out of that particular session. Um, notwithstanding our definition of it though, I think the powerful historical memories of the pains of mass hunger has shaped the culture, to come back to that term, and the international perspectives of the Irish peoples. In the early 1960s, for example, Irish people took a particular interest in the wave of decolonization in Africa and elsewhere. In 1963, then Taoiseach Sean Lamas reflected that the achievement of independence in Africa and Asia, I hear a quote from Lamas, had been followed by the people of Ireland with profound sympathy and satisfaction. How could it be otherwise in view of our history? End quote. In the same year, Lamas spoke in an event in Washington, where he paid tribute to Irish citizens, missionaries, and others working in the developing world at that time. And he described them, I quote, as Ireland's own brand of Peace Corps. I think that's an interesting phrase to conjure with, Ireland's brand of Peace Corps. I wonder, Brendan, if you ever think of yourself as somehow at the heart of a Peace Corps operating around the world. It's one to mull over at some point in time. Anyway, I think there is within Lamas's comment also a pertinent recognition of the effects of this broad diaspora of the Irish across continents in the wake of famine, and the creation of social, educational, and religious networks that have of course become crucial, as again we've heard today, to the Irish role in international development. Ireland's own Peace Corps today consists of globalized networks of non-government and civil society actors who extend and supplement the work of the government. We might even say it's a kind of soft power uh, for the Irish government, another way of thinking about it. In the 50 years since Lamas healed, the Irish commitment to the developing world has been a truly remarkable institutionalization of that commitment. Driven by enlightened political and civil society initiatives that have shaped the course of Irish humanitarian assistance and the fight against hunger. By 2006, the Irish government could confidently advance a white paper on Irish aid that placed the cause of development at the heart of Ireland's foreign policy. And with the concomitant creation of a hunger task force, it further recognized and promoted Ireland's leading international role in matters of food security and nutrition. Again, we've heard a good deal about that today. Key factors in Ireland's strategic approach to humanitarian assistance are, in essence, scale and impact. How does a weak country make the very most of its significant yet limited resources? Ireland, I think, has answered the challenge with imagination. It's prioritized its focus in certain regions, working in selected countries to partner local governments and civil society organizations. It's focused its work in areas of assistance where we have, I think, particular skill sets and ideological commitments. Agriculture has been discussed today, I think, in that light. And of course, it's also developed key partnerships, a term that's used a great deal today, with international organizations and civil society agencies that work, of course, to magnify scale and magnify 
These partnerships are crucial in develop and delivery of Irish aims and programs in the development field and humanitarian assistance. And we heard many examples. I won't run back through, through, the, through all of those at this point in time. Uh, there are many that we would like to discuss more fully another time. With the last panel, we looked further beyond the immediate government roles to the roles of non-government and civil society actors to consider educators and philanthropists, cultural contexts of humanitarian assistance, the need for interdisciplinarity, education, the role of technology, and so on. Much there to mull over as well as we think into the future. But what I think is fitting to acknowledge the achievements of our small nation in these sectors of international affairs, I think we should not be overly sanguine about what these uh, sorry, about these, nor about the challenges that Ireland faces to sustain and evolve in a volatile global environment. While there is a strong moral imperative driving the Irish role in humanitarian assistance, underpinned by a sense of historical legitimacy, this role is also, as it must be, responsive to national interests, geopolitical interests. I quote here from the 2006 White Paper, a very strong, powerful paragraph this. First and foremost, we must we give aid because it is right that we help those in greatest need. We are bound together by more than globalization. We are bound together by a shared humanity. The fate of others is a matter of concern to us. From this shared humanity comes a responsibility to those in great need beyond the borders of our own state. For some, political and strategic motives may influence decisions on the allocation of development assistance. That is not the case for Ireland. For Ireland, the provision of assistance and our cooperation with developing countries is a reflection of our responsibility to others and of our vision of a fair global society. This is a, an admirable statement, but it's also an indicator, I think, of the general challenges ahead in a world where the forces of globalization and the aims of humanitarian assistance are, I think, rarely in sync. After all, there's no guarantee that the future development of globalization will occur in the interests of those who would most benefit from it. As Kofi Annan has reminded us on more than one occasion, and I quote from Anand, inclusive globalization must be built on the great enabling force of the market, but market forces alone will not achieve it. It requires a broader effort to create a shared future. This broader effort requires that a coherent, applied commitment to humanitarian assistance must be attentive to the linkages between development, human rights, which I don't think that a lot of airplay say as it happens, and security. Just as the government must constantly seek to balance political, economic, and other interests, pursuing a foreign policy, policy with development at its center. I think it's very evident that Ireland is seeking to do this, and I'm going to skip, skip to the end here, but I was going to discuss a few examples. It's too late in the day, so I will conclude. I think that much of what we've discussed today is reflecting a broader sea change in international thinking about aid, what is sometimes referred to as the move from aid outputs, uh, sorry, inputs to development outputs. That would be one way to summarize some of the examples that we have been discussing. And within that, of course, things like coordinated responses that are required to address the underlying causes of hunger, in addition to preventing humanitarian crises. Ireland, I think, is indeed taking a lead here. In today's evolving international development and aid environment, existing models of development are being challenged, and new forms of funding are emerging, as again we heard. Increasingly, questions are being asked about the aims and means of development and aid of philanthropic efforts. Amidst this evolution, it's important to maintain a leading role through innovation in planning and delivery. This can and does happen through partnerships that work to design enterprising solutions to poverty. I'm thinking here, for example, of the new ways of treating acute malnutrition that Tom was talking about this morning, a very good example. But I think, finally, it's also important to seek to capture the lessons of such innovation and of the history of Irish development aid more broadly. To be sure, government and civil society organizations have evaluation systems in place, some of these aimed at strategic learning. But the broader lessons to be learned about what Brendan called the past, present, and possible future of Ireland's role in humanitarian assistance can also benefit from a more holistic perspective and analysis. And I hope that during today's symposium, we have contributed to that analysis, and we look forward to continuing these discussions. We we'll hope, hope you will join us
Yeah, Tigger. But, you know. Oh, he was so 